Hello and welcome to Gepet in the Daf. I'm Yael Shimoni, bringing to you together with Yeshiva Trisha and Hadran, learning a bit of Iyun in your Daf Yomi. And today, we're in a very, very famous Iyun sugya, a famous Mishnah and a famous Gemara. Actually, it is so heavy that the main question that I had in my mind writing and creating this effort was, how can I choose a small segment that can make sense in 20 minutes? So that was the hardship. And as you will see, I will end this gaffet in a different way than usual. So join me to see a famous machloka between Rashi and Tosfot. Again, famous for those who have been learning you in the sugiot, the sugiot of mamon hamutal besafek, uh, what happens if you have... Uh, something that you don't know who it belongs to, there's a suffix there. This is a very, very important sugya dealing with this matter. So let's begin with the Mishnah, again, the famous Mishnah, that Kuf Amud Aref, Hamachlif Para Bechamor, Ve'yelda. Uh, you have Kinyan Chalipin, two people, one person gives the other person, uh, they, 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 make, they make an agreement. They say, okay, my cow will be instead of your donkey. And then the way that they make this work is that the buyer, one of them, pulls the donkey, takes the donkey in his possession, and the cow is standing elsewhere. But the minute the person took the cow, the minute the person took the donkey, the cow now belongs to the other side. That's Kinyan Chalipin, Hamachlif Para Bechamu. Now, how is the story getting more sophisticated? The cow, as it's written in the Mishnah, is pregnant. And then the cow gives birth. And we, since we were not standing next to the cow while she gave birth, these two people were in a different place dealing with the donkey. They don't know. Did the cow give birth before the donkey was taking the possession of the other side or not? Why is this so important? There's a big enough kamina. If the cow gave birth after the donkey was pulled for the other side, then this calf belongs to one side. And if this cow gave birth before the donkey was taken, the, this calf has to stay at the original owner because the owner sold the pregnant cow. He didn't sell a cow and a calf. And therefore, if the pregnancy ended successfully before the transaction, then the calf belongs to the original owner. So it is unclear what to do. And the Mishnah says, Yachlok. In such a situation, we don't know who is the owner of the calf. So they're doing Yachlok. Rashi here explains that the reason the Mishnah decided to say that this is Kinyan Chalipin is because this problem can only take us in Kinyan Chalipin. If it would have been Kinyan Maut, that somebody would actually buy the cow with money, that's a different story because in order to finish that Kinyan, you have to actually go and pull the cow. And then you would see if the cow is pregnant or not. That would make everything clear. But since here it's Kinyan Chalipin, that's what creates the problem. Let's continue to the Gemara. The Gemara asks, Am I yachloku? Why did the Mishnah say that the din here is Yachloku? It seems that there could have been a different conclusion to this suffix. What is the Gemara offering? Am I yachloku? Says the Mishnah, when we're in, says the Gemara, when we're in Suffolk, we use other tools. And one of the tools we use is to see where is the object that's being in dispute. The place of the object will, create, will make us understand who is the owner. What does that mean? If I have the cow in my house, and we were out in uh, Shuk Machne Yuda making a transaction, and you pulled the donkey. Since the cow is in my house, the cow does belong to you, but the calf, which is unclear who it belongs to, will remain in my possession because he is in my house. That's what the Gemara says. Is this calf in your house or is it in the other person's house? Says the Gemara, says Rabbi Chia. No, you have to understand, we have to add another point to this Mishnah. We have to do an Okinta. 
let's talk about a situation that I sent this cow out to eat uh, in the field. It's not in my house, and that's where the cow gave birth. Then there is no possession of ground to conclude where this cow belongs to and where the calf belongs to because she's out in the field and not in my house. This is a new kinta. Says the Gemara still, so we have another rule of uh, possession, not where the object is placed, but who was the original owner. We have a rule in Chazakot that if there is a situation, a given situation, for example, you have a mikveh that is tower, it has uh, 40 uh, se'ah in it, and now after a week you suddenly discover that the mikveh is not kasher anymore because it's it lost some of its water. How do you know when did he lose its water? You continue the original chazaka till you're 100% sure that it ended. That's chazaka de mi'ikara. So we have here a similar chazaka, chazaka de marakama. We know that this calf belonged originally to me. So in order to change its status, you're going to have to bring proof. And since there's a suffix and you have no proof, it will remain in my possession until you bring proof otherwise. So the Gemara basically asks, we don't understand why here we have such a big suffix. We have tools to, to make decision in the suffix, either the place where the calf is, or if it's out there in the field, still the original owner, the original owner of the cow and the calf, he will be the owner in the situation, in the situation of suffix. Continues the Gemara and says, Hamani sulchusi. No, this Mishnah is not according to the Shita of Chachamim. It's according to the Shita of Sulchus that says Mamon mutar besafek cholkim belo shvua. So this is the famous sugya, a big machloket between Chachamim and Sulchus. The Chachamim seem to think that all kinds of chazakot can help us reach conclusions regarding. Tzfikot. And Sumchus, it seems, doesn't take these chazakot seriously, and he thinks that in this situation, it is still a suffix, and the suffix is yachloku. Wonderful. This is just the basic, basic pshad of the sugya. Actually, there's a lot of discussion what is really the source and the meaning and the implication of this machloket between chachamim and Sumchus. And this is what's a little too big for our gefet. But there is a smaller issue here that is actually discussed in other places in chess. So hold on, this is a little more complicated than usual, but I think we can do it in uh, 15 minutes. So as we see, here we have the sugiyam, that if there's a suffix, you do either yachloku or hamotzi mechavera alavareya. According to Chachamim, it's hamotzi mechavera alavareya, either possession, or original ownership. According to Sulchus, he doesn't care about these two things, that's what it seems, and therefore he will split the value without any shvua. Why is this important without any shvua? Because the Gemara and two other sugyas asks, how come we see similar situations that have different halachot? It seems that our sugya says that in any case of Safek, according to Chachamim, you'll do a motzi mechaveru alavaraya, and according to Sumchus, you'll do Yechloku. But if we'll go back to the beginning of the Masechta, very famous Mishnah that you all know, Here, the opening Mishnah of Baba Metziah is different from both Sumchus and Chachamim, right? Because here, it says that you have a suffix and you do machloket b'shvua. Sunchu said you're doing cholkim belo shvua. Chachamim said amotzi mechaber alav araya. How come here you have a different ruling? And the Gemara there in Daf Bera Murbeit asks from our Mishnah, and it asks lema matnitin deloke sunchus. Maybe this Mishnah is not like sunchus, even though there's a yachloku here and a yachloku there. The ikas sunchus amar mamona mutar b'sefek cholkim belo shvua. The Gemara asks, who's the Baal of this Mishnah? It can't be Sunchus. Can it be Chachami? That's also a problem. So let's see what the answer of the Gemara there in that space is. 
אפילו תימא סונכוס, כי אמר סונכוס, היכא דאיכא דררא דממונה, אבל היכא דליכא דררא דממונה, לא. בסוגי אסס דה דיפרנס בטווין, two people holding a talis, and the situation of a מחליף פרה בחמו, it's two different cases הלכתי, why? because in a מחליף פרה בחמו you have something that is called דררא דממונה, and here in the Talis, you don't have that factor, and that factor makes the difference. Again, the Gemara did not explain, what is the Rara de Mamona? We don't understand even the words. And that's really what we're going to have to try to understand. Another Gemara that adds the story of the Rara de Mamona is a different sugya. Here it's not a Mishnah, it's a Mimra of Rav Nachman. Rav Nachman in Baba Basra Al Medalid uh, talks about two people who are fighting on a piece of land. One says, I inherited this land, it was my parents' land, and the other person says, no, it's my parents' land, I inherited the land. And here, it is also Mamona Muta Besafik, but Rav Nachman doesn't say Achloku, he doesn't say Achloku Beshavur, he says something different. I'm a Rav Nachman, kol de'alim gava. The stronger one will take the land. Very interesting. Sugiya, I'm sure we'll do a kefir on it when we'll get to Baba Vasa. But anyway, the Sugiya there, Uh, and Daphne Amit Hay asks, why is Rav Nachman here doing a different rule than a Machlif Barah Bechamor? It should have been Yachloku. Let's read the Gemara. Uma ishna mehadetna na Machlif Barah Bechamor v'yalda. Hatam, says the Gemara, it lay drara de mamona, v'lehu it lay drara de mamona, hacha, i demar lo demar, v'i demar lo demar. Again, the Gemara says, The situation of a machlif para b'chamor is unique because you have their drara de mamona, and that you don't have in the story of two people fighting over land. So what do we see here? We see that we have something that is called drara de mamona. The drara de mamona we have only in the Mishnah that you're learning, the machlif para b'chamor. There you have drara de mamona. But in Talis and in land, there's no drara de mamona. And of course, we want to understand what do these words mean. mean because we understand this is something very crucial in the Mishnah there is some kind of halachic situation here that, that we have to see and understand in order to see why this case is different why here you have Yachloku and you don't have Yachloku Bishvua or Kol De'alim Gava. So what is Dara De Ramona? That's the Machloket between Rashi and Tosfod and I want us to learn that Machloket together. So let's begin with Rashi. Rashi explaining Dara De Ramona is in a few places. One of them is in the beginning of the Masechta and the Afber Amidbet on the Sugiya that we learned there. The Gemara says that the difference between the Talis and the Machlif Para B'chamor is that the Talis doesn't have Dara De Ramona and the Machlif Para B'chamor does. So explains Rashi, what is Dara De Ramona? Chesron Mamon. Rehard Ramona says Rashi is losing your Mamon. A loss of Mamon. A loss. Why is there a loss in a Machlif Parah B'chamor? And why is there a loss in the situation of, of selling the, the cow, the pregnant cow? She'im mi parah ze shelo kadin have chesron Mamon. Ve'im ishterenu shelo kadin nimtza ze chasar valad parato. Okay, Rashi explains, when I was selling my, you were selling your donkey to get my pregnant cow. So you thought that you're buying a pregnant cow, right? And if now what you're getting is just a cow that is not pregnant, you're losing money. On the other hand, I was hoping that the cow will get birth before the transaction because I was interested only in selling the cow, not a cow and a calf. And if you will take the calf from me, I will be losing my calf. Okay, so we understand why in a machlik parah b'chamor there's a loss of money. Why isn't there a loss of money in the talis? So let's go back to the situation of the talis. What's happening in the talis? The talis, it's two people who found a mitziah and held it up together, right? The story there is a mitziah. They're fighting who's the one who caught it first. So this is not a loss. It is preventing someone, one of the two sides, to gain. That's the difference. If you have a suffix, that the suffix will create somebody to lose something that was actually his, that's deciding on somebody losing. 
But here, it's just telling to one of them, I'm sorry, you thought you had an opportunity to gain extra money. That opportunity is not given to you. This is a different suffolk and a different situation. And that's why the halacha there will be different. And in order to do yachloka, you'll have to add a shavua in. And here, in a machlif parah since we're talking about loss, and both sides are really about to lose, then we do the pshara of yachloka. So that's what Rashi explained. Jarara de mamona is loss of ownership, loss of money. And therefore, it will only be in a situation that people who are actually owners of something. Here in a metzia, no one is an owner of this metzia, of this mamon. It's just the people who are looking for new options and new opportunities and gaining more wealth. It's not losing their original wealth. So that's Rashi. Tosfo, in a few places, gives a totally different explanation to what Rara the Mamona is. Let's see how he explains Dara de Mamona in our sugya. So in Daf Kuf. So in Tosot Yimor Matchil Velichze Bereshut Man Kaima, not in the beginning of the Tosot, there's a kushia. In the Yesh Lomar, when he goes back to explain the kushia, we won't get into that kushia because it's a little complicated for us at this time, says the Tosot, Ve'yesh Lomar, Kevan De'ika Derara de Mamona, so, says the Tosod, what is Drara de Mamona? Drara de Mamona is a situation that there is a suffix from reality, not from what they're saying in their mouth. In any case, you have the reality and then you have what people are saying. Let's say we're in a comics, so you have the picture and then you have the bubbles. So says Tosfo, the suffix with the cow is a suffix that even if no one would be saying anything, even if they would not be fighting, Basin would be looking and saying, well, we don't know what's happening with this cow because the situation itself creates a suffix. That's Gerardo de Ramona. But if we'll go back to two people holding a talis, what is creating the suffix there? Because they're fighting and saying, Kula Sheli. But if we erase the bubbles of the comics of the people have holding that talis, there's no suffix here. What do we see? Two people holding together a piece of cloth. Therefore, it seems to be belonging to both of them. What is creating the suffix is the text and not reality. So this is the Shita of Tosfot. Exchanging a cow and a donkey without a claim, with no text, there is still a question, what happened? Where was the calf born? But holding a talis, there you just see two people holding on to the talis. Let's add in also the other sugya that bothered us, two people fighting over a piece of land or two people fighting over a boat. When you see a boat or a land, it's just there. The only thing that is creating the suffix is what people are saying about the land. So again, the land doesn't seem to be in suffix. It's not a situation which is unclear. It's just a piece of land standing there because no one is holding the land. So that's the Shita of Tosfut. As, as we see, it's different from Rashi. According to Rashi, the Beithin actively divides the property because there is a risk of financial loss. That's Drara de Mamona. And according to Tosfot, Beitin follows what reality looks like. Beitin is turning down all the discussion around and looking. If he sees a problem in reality, he will relate to that problem and do a choku. But if there is no problem in reality, he will go to different solutions. So this is a different explanation of Dora de Omona and a different explanation of why Beitin here is doing a choku in the sugya. What is unclear is why did Tosfot diverse from Rashi's Shita? Rashi said something that makes sense. I, I like the Svara of Rashi. And Tosfot in no place explains what is his kushia. We know that a lot of times Tosfot quotes Rashi and then says, Kashe. and here we don't have that. But in the Rishonim that came later, Ramban, Ran, Ritva, you have a quotation of a kushia that Tosfot asked on Rashi. So let's see the kushia as the Ritva frames it. 
והקשו עליו בתוספות, אוקיי? Okay? He quotes Rashi and bring the Kushia, הקשו עליו בתוספות, מהדה אמרינן בפרק חזקת הבתים, גבי זה אומר של אבותיי, וזה אומר של אבותיי, דאמר רב נחמן כל דאלין גבר, וכן בהאי ערבה דהבומין צהלה בית רי, ופרשינה האטם, שום דלק על אחד מן היוד רבה דממונה, So where does the Kushia start? It starts now from the Talis that we explained very well for Rashi. The Tosfot thinks that Rashi cannot really explain the story of the land and the boat. Why? Because Rashi said that Drar de Mamona is when somebody is about to lose ownership that they had, not if they're opportunists like the Talis. But here in the land, one person says, I'm the owner of the land because it was... my parents' land. And the other person says, I'm the owner of the land, so it's my parents' land. So yes, Tosfot, ve'im kefirush Rashi, he'ach en shem drara de mamona. How can Rashi say that when two people are fighting and each one of them is claiming that it's his land, of course, it's ownership. It's not, they haven't, it's not fighting over who found this land first. It worked with the Talis very well, Rashi's explanation. But how can Rashi's explanation explain that Fighting over land is no drara de mamona, because there, if this land is actually one of them, we don't know which, when we will make a pasak, we will be taking away and gaining a loss, and a big loss. This is a piece of land. You know, land is expensive. Also, there's a story there on a ship. Ships are expensive. This is a big chisaron. It's not preventing um, opportunities. new opportunities, it's creating loss. So this is Mamash against Rashi, because the Sugiya there claimed that in the situation of a land, there is no drawer de Mamona. And if Rashi is right, this is against his Svara and his explanation. And here, the Ritva offers at the end of his commentary, a way to solve Rashi's problem. But here I will end the Gephit in a different way than usual. I decided not to read with you The answer of the Ritva. The Ritva's answer is just one answer. There are also other answers. I'm leaving this as a Kushia. Again, Rashi said that Dara de Mamona is Chisaron b'Mamon. And it doesn't work with the Sugiya and Baba Basra. What would Rashi respond to the Tosfot's question? So, first you should know that maybe you think that the easiest way is to go and read what Rashi said in Baba Basra, right? But the problem is that this is a sugiya in Baba Basra la Medal, and Rashi finished his commentary for Baba Basra and Dach Kafachet. He died in the middle of the commentary and Rashbam took over. So we don't know what Rashi wrote on that sugiya. So we have to use our heads, we have to use our sabara, and I'm leaving this as an opening to you. I think we've learned uh, enough for today, and I'm very happy to leave you with Fakushia. And as you know, there are many answers to this. If somebody wants, you can go and read the Ritva or look for other explanations. How will Rashi answer Tosfot's question? How will he explain that there in the land, there is no Chisaron Mamon? That's really what you have to do now after this Gafet ends. So today, uh, we did something different. Uh, what was hard on this Gafet is to take a sugiya that is very rich and to find a piece that can help and assist you. And I hope maybe someday, maybe soon, you will be learning Mamona Mutab Safek. And what we learned today, the Mechloket of Rashi will also will be of assistance. Just another addition, you should know that there are other Rishonim that have other explanations to what Drara de Mamona is. We see that we have this word in the Gemara, which is unclear. And we just saw two explanations of Mechlokot between Rashi and Tosfot, but those of you who will learn the Sugiya Biyun will see that there are other options there as well. So I hope you enjoyed our short Iyun, but heavy Iyun this time. And Bezrat Hashem, we will meet again next week, already before Shavuos, Bezrat Hashem, or maybe after. May you have a good Matan Torah, and those of you who are learning, Daf Yumi should be very happy and be filled with, of energy from this coming Chag of Matan Torah because you're definitely doing a lot in your everyday lives to be Mechabel Torah. So Yishar Koach to you all and we will speak again soon. <laughs> Take care.